There we go. So our guest today, Dr. Judy Stone, has given me a little heads up that she has a large thunderstorm system that's going through her area right now. So there's a possibility that she may get cut off during the middle of the program. It's quite all right. She's got a backup generator and she'll hop on. Um, I'm gonna introduce Judy, who I've had a, a nice opportunity to have some conversations with recently. So I'm very much looking forward to this program and her book. Um, Judy Stone is an infectious disease physician, a Forbes Pharma and healthcare contributor, the author of a nationally established textbook called Conducting Clinical Research, a practical guide for physicians, nurses, study coordinators, and investigators. Along with her commitment to physical healing, she has an avid interest in oral history and Holocaust education. Through telling her family's remarkable story, she hopes to teach tolerance and contribute to making the world a better, more peaceful and more just place. Dr. Stone will donate the net profits from this book to organizations that promote Holocaust education. So again, I'm so grateful that you're here tonight, Dr. Stone. And with that, I turn the program over to you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and let me see if I've got the right slides up. Are you, you're not seeing <clears throat> the PowerPoint yet. No, nope, okay. you can go ahead and screen share, and I think it worked when you square shared the second screen. Right. Is it working for you now? Yes, it is. Perfect. Ter terrific. Well, thank you so much again for having me. You've been a delight uh, to work with and have taught me so much about Zoom uh, in addition to other things. And it's nice seeing a few people uh, that I know and, and otherwise a very large turnout. That's great. Um, so what brought, this, what brought this about is that uh, I wanted to share my family's story and say never again. Uh, you can see this is my mother, um, Maggie, in the book of Magdush, and my, my daughter, Heather, uh, on my mother's 94th birthday. And this is my uncle, Alex, who was my father's brother, and my aunt, Kitty, who is uh, 90, 95 now and is the only one who's still surviving. So they were the impetus of the book because um, Alex in particular was very into oral history and was the family historian. And my family wanted me to share their stories and know that they left their, their mark trying to leave the world a, a just and more just and kinder place. And this book came about in part because, can you hear okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, somebody is, uh, uh, I wasn't sure. Uh, so my mother literally, when she was in the hospital near dying, she said, take out your computer and start writing because I know you won't remember this stuff. And uh, she was absolutely right. And I wish she had started earlier. I'm gonna tell you a little bit uh, about the rise of Nazism first and a little bit of background. So in the early 1930s, the mood in Germany was grim uh, because Germany had lost World War I and had to pay heavy reparations and they felt very humiliated by this. They, this set the stage, this economic worsening set the stage for uh, the rise of Nazism um, and, and Adolf Hitler because they were economically and uh, psychologically depressed in Germany at that time. In 1932, there was an election and the Nazis won just 37% of the vote, not a majority, but they installed uh, President von Hindenburg and he appointed Hitler Chancellor of Germany. And so Hitler was given almost unlimited power at that point. In February of 1933, the, the a uh, German parliament building burnt down. And they said that it was uh, communists planning a violent uprising, but in fact it was set up and planned by the Nazis and was used as an excuse to declare uh, emergency powers and suspend civil liberties and constitutional protections. And also in, uh, the very next month, Hitler established Dachau uh, which was a concentration camp, and he used that at first for political prisoners, not, not for Jews, but for political prisoners. The German uh, parliament, parliament passed the Enabling Act, which removed the power of legislation from the parliament and gave it to the Nazi-controlled government, creating a legally declared dictatorship. 
Do you see similar things happening now with, with uh, the balance of powers in our, uh, in our government? In 1938, various countries got together at the Evian con conference. 32 countries got together to express concern about the Ger German Jewish refugee problem. And while they said they, they were sympathetic to those who were being persecuted, uh, that they didn't change anything and they did not offer to do any, any help. So that sent a loud signal to the Nazis that they could do whatever they wanted with the Jews and nobody would stop them. Kristallnacht happened November 9th, 1938. And this too was designed by the propaganda minister, uh, Joseph Goebbels, to look like a spontaneous uprising against the Jews. And in fact, it was well orchestra orchestrated. And during, the, during this uh, night, two nights of horror, or the, the night of broken glass, over 250 synagogues were burned over 7,000 Jewish business businesses were trashed and looted, and 30,000 German Jewish men were arrested simply because they were Jewish. And they were sent to concentration camps where many of them, many of them died. The rest of the people uh, throughout um, Eastern, Eastern Europe were sent to ghettos, which were crowded older parts of town, um, and often where Jews were already concentrated, but they, they put the Jews together in these, and many families would share an apartment. Uh, the, the area was cordoned off and was guarded, and uh, there was a lot of starvation that went on there, and overcrowding, starvation, and many infectious diseases ran rampant through there, typhus and diarrhea, and uh, many people died because of that. So let's switch to my family's story. My father was from Debrecen, which was the uh, second largest city in Hungary and was, is uh, the major city on the eastern part of Hungary. At the time he was growing up, it had a population of 100,000 and it was sophisticated. It had electricity, it had theater and universities. You can see a trolley here. Uh, as I say, quite a cosmopolitan center. In contrast, this was my mother's village and in fact, her home is where these two benches uh, are in this picture. And it had dirt roads, a population of 2,000, which is about what Booth Bay Harbor is, uh, is in the winter, except Sharan didn't have running water or electricity. And it had animals running in the road, even when I was there in 1978. It was, so it was uh, the city girl, uh, or the city boy and the country girl uh, met and fell in love and brought their, uh, different cultures together. This is my grandmother, uh, my grandmother, Anna. She had eight children. Um, obviously only a few of them are shown here. This is Clara, uh, who is my favorite aunt, and Hendika, who is the baby. And this is Kitty when she was just seven years old. Anna and Gabriella died of typhoid fever in 1932 when they went to, after going to a family wedding. Um, my mother and Clara were seriously ill, but did not die. And Kitty uh, did not become ill. Kitty was not taken because her mother didn't like her so much. And her mother thought she was ugly and didn't take, didn't take her to any family get togethers. And that's something that, that even though she's 95 now, that still hurts her. Um, so when she, uh, when Anna died, Kitty was seven, my mother was 12 years older, and Maggie ended up raising Kitty after that. This was my grandfather Moore, my mother, uh, Kitty a few years later, and my father and mother when they were dating, on, and uh, this picture was on their farm in 1936. There was a fourth sister, uh, her name was Betty, or Queen Elizabeth is what the family called her. Uh, somewhat disparagingly, and she looked much more exotic than the other ones, um, darker, and she, uh, so she, she was also called, somewhat disparagingly, she was called the Tsigan, or the, the Gypsy. And this is my mother and Clara. This was a cousin, uh, also named Magda, and she was very close, their family was very close to, to my family, uh, to my, my mother's family. 
and Magda and her parents, and at the time of uh, the war, she was married and had children of her own, and they were all killed at Auschwitz. So this, this uh, picture is uh, pretty special f uh, for the remaining family, and in fact, uh, her, uh, her sister, uh, I guess it's her aunt, lives, lives in Rochester uh, still which is interesting. So in, in the 1930s, say, the Germans put different squeezes on, on uh, against the Jews. First, there was the Nuremberg race laws, and that restricted who could be a civil servant and have various professions. So this was, these restrictions were called the numerous clauses, and that limited the Jews' education and professions to less than 6%, which was their percentage in the hospital. So, uh, sorry, in the population. Uh, I've been working too much. Um, Alex, this is a picture of Alex. He wasn't allowed to go to university to study mathematics as he had wanted to uh, because he didn't, uh, he didn't meet that quota. He later was allowed to study uh, law, but then not allowed to practice. These two women were classmates of his, uh, made it here, both of these women later went on to help save my mother's life in the camp and be very important uh, to our family. Miri, though, was uh, in school with Alex and literally was thrown down, down the stairs and told not to come back to the university. My grandfather was a uh, wounded and decorated World War I officer who was very well respected in the area and uh, uh, for his service and by the local people because he helped the townspeople a lot with um, writing documents for them. Many of them were illiterate. Uh, he uh, extended credit to them he, in his general store uh, and the like. He was very well respected, but he was not protected like he thought he was. First, he lost his liquor license. Uh, for it, that he used to maintain the family tavern. Uh, then he experienced a, a progressively greater economic squeeze on the family. And Jews throughout Europe had to give up their businesses. It was called the Aryanization of businesses and have a Gentile take over, uh, take over the business. So here we are with how the family looked as the war was starting. Um, this is, this is Kitty, who's now 18 and matured into a, an attractive young woman, despite what her mother said. And this is uh, Clara and Betty, the, the uh, Tsigang, or Queen Elizabeth, and my parents uh, on their, um, their engagement photo. Here's my, my father and Alex again. Uh, with their mother and brother Yenner. And this was taken, my father was in, uh, he was drafted in 1939 at a time when they still allowed Jews to uh, fight in the army and he was in the artillery. Later on as the, as the war progressed, Jews were only allowed to uh, be forced laborers and weren't allowed to have weapons or do anything other than, than grunt work. The Nazis invaded Hungary on March 19, 1944. They didn't have too much trouble doing that because the Hungarians were very willing accomplices uh, to that. And in fact, the Hungarian Nazi equivalent, which was called the Arrow Cross, was uh, very brutal and worse in some cases than, than the Germans were. When the uh, Nazis came in, the Jews had to wear a yellow star for identification that you've seen, you've all seen and heard about. Now, at first, uh, people were allowed out of their homes. Kitty lived still in Charant with her father. The others were, were in the cities. But Kitty, Kitty lived uh, in Charant, and one of her friends came to take her out uh, for an outing for a little bit to cheer her up. And Kitty, Kitty's coat uh, lapel fell over and covered her yellow star, and she was arrested for for uh, not for that star not being visible, and she was jailed in the next town. In the 1980s, Kitty went back to Hungary, and she went and looked up Jofinani, who was her housekeeper, who had uh, walked six miles and bribed someone to get Kitty out of jail and back to her her father. 
There were a number of good people, and that's one of the things that Kitty in particular emphasizes in her talks. And I wanted to share that perspective with you because you don't often hear about that. When the Germans invaded Hungary, uh, they wanted to rape my Aunt Kitty. And so for weeks, she would at night, af after this one ugly incident at night, she would go across the lane to uh, hide under the bed of my grandfather's best friend here, uh, who was named Totbachi or Uncle Mike, uh, she, she called him. She slept on the dirt floor under his bed in this one room shack. He was a widower by that point and the chickens were running around and she did that every night. And every night, uh, Mr. Tot r risked his life to hide her and he treated her like his own daughter. Later, he said he couldn't die until Kitty and, and Moore came back from the war. And of course, that never happened. And uh, he ended up uh, dying. And his last request was to be buried with Kitty's blanket. And in fact, he was. Another good person or righteous Gentile, as they're uh, known, is Karoj Kovesti. And Karoj was a school teacher uh, who taught, who taught uh, Kitty. And he would come and climb over the fence at night to bring, bring uh, Kitty and my grandfather food and news and just keep them company and show that not everybody hated them and, and that people cared about them. One of the things that haunts Kitty is that he committed suicide when they were deported. And she doesn't know whether that was because uh, he was threatened, somebody reported him for being uh, friendly to the Jews or what happened, but it's still uh, bothers her. He, he had um, three or four little, little children of his own. So as, as I said, the, the Jews in the early 1940s were no longer able to work as, as soldiers and were used as forced laborers. Built, initially, they worked building roads and railways, and then they were sent to the Eastern Front where they cl cl uh, cleared minefields. One of my mother's twin brothers was blown up there. Now, some of you may have heard about the Apopo hero rats in Africa. Those are the rats that are sent out to the minefields in Angola and other countries to show where, where the landmines are so they can be safely cleared. Well, they didn't have hero rats at that point. They used Jews who they considered nothing better than, uh, than rats or insects. Uh, we're, we're lucky that more weren't killed there. Jews everywhere, as I mentioned, were forced into the ghettos where many died from disease. My mother, in fact, was forced into the ghetto in Debrecen, along with, with her mother-in-law. Uh, and my mother had her first child. My brother, uh, Yoji, was born there. In many places, the, the ghettos, uh, people weren't confined to the older parts of, of the cities, but were housed in open air brickyards because that made it easier to transport the Jews directly to, to uh, the death camps if you were already on the rail, the rail line. My two week old brother died of exposure and pneumonia waiting to be deported in the Surly brickyard in, in Debrecen. And one of the things that I find really remarkable is that my mother recognized that her baby's death saved her life. Uh, and she found, you know, later found meaning in that. And as she knew, she would have been immediately killed had she arrived at Auschwitz with, with the baby. Here's a picture of the arrival of the groups at Auschwitz. Now, some people say, how do we, how is it that we have these pictures? Um, you know, is this a recreation? No, it's not. The Germans wanted to document everything that they did. And so they had photographers, uh, documenting momentous occasions like, like uh, Jews being brought to the death camp. What happened first is that men were separated from the women. And here are a group of women with their children uh, already separated from their husbands and looking terrified. They had a process called selection and selection determined who would live and who would die. In this case, Betty, Kitty and my mother survived Auschwitz. They were young, they were healthy, they were strong. And so they, it was decided that they were valuable enough that they would be put to work at Auschwitz and not sent to the death camp. 
to the, to the gas chambers. On the other hand, my grandmother was 54, so she was considered over the hill, and she was sent immediately to be gassed when she arrived on July 1st, 1944. Her son Jenner was killed with her. He was 32. He had meningitis when he was a child, and so he was mentally disabled, mildly so, but he was not considered worth, worth saving because of that disability. Kitty and my grandfather arrived and they were, they were again together in the ghetto in Sharand and then other ghettos uh, and the uh, trains, the, tra the cattle cars to Auschwitz. Uh, and when they arrived at Auschwitz, they were separated. He was 65, so he was immediately killed. Well, Andy or Anchi uh, is, is, was my father's first cousin. We were very close to them, and I like including his story because different people in the family have different, had different experiences. And while, as you see, several people in my family, uh, my mother's family, were fortunate enough to survive, Andy was 15 at the time of the war, and he was the sole survivor in his family. Um, he saw his father murdered in front of him, his mother and, and other siblings were murdered at, at Auschwitz. After Andy was liberated, um, he went to Palestine and fought for Israeli independence in the Palmach. He was one of only three men who survived his unit in, in, that, uh, in that war. And yet what amazed me is that despite all those horrors that he witnessed and that he, he went through, he was one of the kindest, nicest, most generous people in our family. Um, and his was actually one of the first stories that I learned. Um, my daughter interviewed him when she was preparing to do her bat mitzvah, uh, which is when you, when you turn 13. And that was uh, when I learned his story. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, my mother and her two sisters miraculously survived Auschwitz. Betty was arrested initially on March 19th, 1944, when the Germans came in. She was arrested as a political prisoner, uh, arriving back from vacation to Budapest, uh, getting off the train, she was arrested and she was sent to a, a part of the concentration camp, a part of Auschwitz called Canada, which was a really uh, horrendous part of the camp um, where they sorted, the prisoners there had to sort the clothes and go through the belongings of the people who had been gassed looking for any valuables. Uh, so that was a, a particularly gruesome part uh, of Auschwitz. They also, they were allowed to keep their hair, uh, the women there, and that was so that they could dupe new arrivals. They would have women looking fairly normal uh, with hair and, and normal, sometimes normal clothing, greet the, greet the people being brought in by the trains so that the people, so that the new, new uh, prisoners wouldn't panic and try to escape or create a ruckus. Uh, so in fact, sometimes, um, and my mother recalled, they actually had orchestras pay, uh, playing music when, when they arrived, when she arrived at the camp at Auschwitz. Kitty arrived next in June of 1944. And then a couple of weeks later, my mother uh, uh, arrived on July 1st. Now, even though uh, these other women and most of the prisoners had their heads shaved as soon as they arrived, they were, they were stripped, they were shaved of all their body hair and, and uh, deloused and given rags to wear. Uh, sometimes prisoners recognized each other still and so uh, somebody recognized my mother and told Kitty that my, that my mother was there. And they were in different barracks, but Kitty heard that. And uh, Kitty, although it was illegal to do so, and she would have been killed had she been discovered, she wandered over to my mother's barracks and saw how, what horrible shape my mother was in, having just lost, lost her baby. She was physically devastated and emotionally a wreck. Uh, as you might expect. And uh, Kitty recognized that my mother would not survive uh, if she were on her own. And so she managed to 
change barracks, although this was strictly forbidden. <clears throat> now, part of, part of uh, why she was able to do that is because um, the Germans, at that point, they were, it was towards the end of the war and they were, they were in a rush. <clears throat> they didn't even tattoo numbers on, on, on the prisoners arriving at that point. Um, and they didn't, they didn't uh, keep track of prisoners by their names. They just, women or, or men, lined up in rows of five for roll call multiple times a day. And as long as the numbers matched, uh, there was not uh, any question. So Kitty was able to, to uh, leave her friend in another barrack and uh, switch to my mother's. She felt guilty over leaving her, her, her other friend. And a few days later, she went back to visit this, this girl, Itza, at her original barracks. And she found that that whole barracks, a thousand young Hungarian Jewish women had vanished overnight, presumably, uh, presumably killed overnight. And uh, that too is something that uh, still haunts Kitty. As I mentioned, while, while my family my nuclear family did pretty well with with survival. Sorry, or I wouldn't be here. Uh, more than eighty, more than eighty other family members that I know of were killed at Auschwitz. Say nothing of other other camps or other places in the war. So after they were together there for nine weeks in Auschwitz, there was another selection, and Kitty was sent with a group, actually with Ella and Mary, the two women you saw in the first slide, that they were sent to a work camp called Allendorf, which was a munitions plant. And she went back there in the 1980s. They had, uh, the children of that town had a reunion for all of the women who survived Allendorf because they wanted to know what had happened when they were kids. Uh, they really had no idea what their parents had been hiding. So anyway, Kitty went to, to Allendorf and you can see the uh, trees that were used to camouflage the factory there on top of the building. Almost all of the women survived this camp because they had somewhat better conditions. They were given a little bit better food, uh, for example, because they were working with toxic chemicals. So at that selection uh, where Kitty was sent to Allendorf, my mother was found to be having milk leaking from her breast. And so she was thrown back. And everyone assumed that she was murdered at that point because they didn't just let pregnant or lactating women hang around. Uh, the Nazis generally murdered them. So they didn't know what happened to her. They just, everybody assumed she was killed. Uh, two years ago, I had a shocking finding from, from the Holocaust Museum. So one of the things that bothered me always is, uh, if you don't know, if most of you are, are not Jewish, uh, you don't know, you may not know that in the Jewish tradition, uh, you observe the anniversary of your loved one's death, not so much their birthday, but their death. And that's called their yardzeit. And it bothered me that I didn't know when my grandfather's death was because there were no records. And I tried contacting all sorts of places in Germany and the Red Cross Tracing Service and Bad Arelson and could not find any records. Even though the Germans were meticulous record keepers, they couldn't come up with my grandfather. So um, two years ago, uh, the Holocaust Museum uh, sent me this card that they found on Kitty. And it's her prisoner card or halfling card. And uh, it's like a um, demographic card you might have at school or when you're hospitalized and people ask you what your, what your name is, what your uh, first name is, who your next of kin is, etc. And one of the things that I didn't notice the first time I looked at this card, because I don't speak or read German, uh, but when I went back carefully line by line, I saw this line where, where the uh, white arrow is. And what that is, is the date of arrival at Auschwitz. And that it was June 28th, 1944. And so that's when I knew uh, that that's when my, my grandfather was murdered. And it was like a sucker punch. I mean, it just, it just really, um, really hit me. Um, 
there's a mystery on here. Uh, it says that she was transferred to Buchenwald and Kitty says she was never transferred to Buchenwald uh, and in fact was liberated from Allendorf. So we've not, not figured out uh, what that was all about or whether they were just planning on sending this group of women to Buchenwald to be gassed. But there, there are discrepancies and if you look at Holocaust, if you try to do any Holocaust research, you'll find some things that just don't fit. So it turns out that my mother, of course, was not gassed or I wouldn't be here. Uh, she was sent on another work detail and was sent to Berlin to work on an airplane factory. And uh, again, conditions were lousy there. Uh, but at one point, her foreman learned that she could sew. And so he had her uh, sew gloves for his son, who was on the Eastern Front. And he gave her a few apples in exchange for that and let her sit down some, uh, rather than stand on the assembly line the whole time. So that helped her, uh, that act of kindness helped save her. When the Nazis knew they were losing the war, they sent. Th they didn't want uh, the Allies to discover what they had done in the concentration camps, so they sent people out on, uh, they sent prisoners out on death marches. And Betty started uh, earlier than my mother's, uh, but my mother walked more than 100 miles from Berlin up to Rostock on the North Sea, where uh, they were supposed to be exchanged for some medical supplies. Now she was so weak and her legs were so swollen uh, by having, by the malnutrition and uh, by having been in the camps for eight months at that point uh, that she could barely walk. And anyone who couldn't keep up and fell out of line was shot. So what happened, as I mentioned, they always had to be in rows of five. And even in the camps too, if somebody was weak, the women put them in the middle trying to hide them from the guards and sometimes would help hold them up. Uh, and they were most, many of them were very kind to each other. And so that act of kindness saved my mother's life on the death march. After she was liberated by the Russians, uh, she uh, walked back to Berlin, God knows how, because she was 60 some pounds. And then she eventually found her way back to her village of Sharand unbeknownst to anybody else. Uh, my father and Alex were on the Eastern Front and then in Dachau, which was one of the more notorious uh, concentration camps, and they both nearly died there, um, but again, miraculously didn't and were liberated, emaciated and ill. Now people ask, how did the family find each other after they were liberated? So, uh, there, there were several ways. Kitty uh, was liberated. The commandant of Allendorf uh, let the women go. He was ordered to send the women to Buchenwald to be exterminated at the end of the war, but he didn't. And whether it was because he was in fact kinder, as Kitty says he was, uh, or whether he was doing that to help save himself in the future, uh, he let the women go and Kitty was found by uh, American airmen. It wasn't safe for the women. She was with tw only 20 women at that point who had been her, her uh, bunk mates, uh, her barracks mate. It wasn't safe for them in the German village. So those airmen took, took uh, that group back to Fritzlar Air Force Base, which they had taken over from, from the Germans. Uh, and Miri and uh, Ella, the other two, of their friends were also there, there with her. So there were, the way people heard about each other was some was simply word of mouth from other survivors. Some, there were newspapers like this. And this literally is, translates as news of those who were dragged away. And there were radio announcements listing names of people and where they were. And so Mitty heard Alex's name on one of those radio announcements and was able to get in touch with him and he came down to the airport, to Zenan in the Air Force Base. So did Betty. Clara was not in Auschwitz. She was in hiding uh, during, during the war. She had escaped a death march from Budapest and was hidden by a guard. 
uh, no picnic, he ended up raping her and she was kept in terrible uh, environment too. Uh, but eventually uh, she, she was freed and uh, she, and she ended up um, marrying another Hungarian. She went back home and she then uh, to Debrecen and then she ended up marrying another uh, Hungarian and they were, they had themselves smuggled uh, across the border to, uh, to Austria because it wasn't safe to stay in Hungary. And it would, it was under, that's when Hungary was taken over by communists. And so you couldn't cross borders except illegally. So to say, Clara, Clara was in a DP camp in Austria at this point and the other siblings were, were here and everybody assumed that my mother was dead. It took them months to find each other. This is my father and mother when they were dating in Sharand. So again, I, I apologize that it gets complicated by so many people. Um, my father, um, we come from a long line of uh, broken families and people who, who uh, uh, died young. So he was raised by his mother, but his father died when he was just uh, eight years old. And this uncle, uh, Jacob, um, helped raise uh, helped raise him. And uh, Jacob was a Hungarian citizen. His uh, sister had immigrated to, uh, to upstate New York and had uh, a child there, had two children there. So they were American citizens. And then they moved back to Hungary um, after her husband died. So in any case, um, these four uh, were in, a, although three of them, the three women were U.S. citizens, they were in a concentration camp in Austria during the war, uh, which was pretty amazing. And afterwards, the child, Mori, uh, was separated from her parents for nine years after liberation because of faulty papers and because her, her mother didn't lie to the authorities about what she had done during the war. Um, so that is a cautionary tale. My father went looking for, again, he had assumed that Maggie had died. He went looking for this uncle who had raised him. And while he uh, was in Budapest, he learned uh, that my mother was alive and he went back uh, to Sharan to look for her and find her. They tried to reestablish their business in Debrecen and uh, rivals to their business, um, which was making orthopedic appliances and corsets, uh, rivals um, had taken over their home and their business and they couldn't make a go of it. And so they decided to join the other siblings in, in Germany. And again, they went over the border illegally uh, to Germany to, to escape Hungary. So we have the coming, Amer coming to America scenario. Um, Kitty was liberated when she was uh, 20. And at the Air Force Base, she met this uh, American, uh, American bomber pilot, Pete. And she decided that, I think she was smitten, but also she didn't want to go back to Hungary and she didn't want to stay in Germany. And so when he proposed to her, she said yes. And uh, after considerable difficulty, they came, they came to the US. After she got here, before they were even married, after she got here, uh, Pete insisted that she never tell anyone that she was Jewish. And here she is, not speaking the language, penniless, and in a foreign country away from her whole family. So what's she gonna do? She said, sure. And so they married, she went to Iowa to his family's farm and uh, thereafter, you know, did, did the typical American um, female role, uh, started having babies one after another, helped on the farm. And later uh, he became abusive and she eventually divorced. 
uh, but she did not tell anybody that she, she was Jewish until 2008, uh, really. Um, she didn't go public with that. <clears throat> and her children were raised as Lutheran. Betty had a similar story. Uh, she converted to Catholicism uh, to, in order to marry an Air Force captain. Uh, her first husband was killed in the war. The, picture, the cover of my book has uh, the wedding picture from her first marriage. He was killed for his coat. Um, anyway, she married an Air Force captain. She moved to Texas and then to Denver, and uh, her children were all raised as Catholic. The siblings continued to scatter. This is my mother and Clara and my father and Clara's then husband, Indra. <clears throat> and uh, in Germany, as they're, as they're preparing to depart Germany. The best thing that uh, uh, Kitty and Pete did, that Pete did was he sponsored Clara. Now you had to have a sponsor and a lot of people don't understand that. Uh, you, you couldn't just say, oh, I want to come to the U.S. The U.S. didn't want people any more then than they do now, and they particularly didn't want Jews. <clears throat> so you had to have a sponsor and Keith, <clears throat> and uh, Pete did that. There was a problem there, because you remember that Pete didn't want people to know that Kitty was Jewish. Well, Imra's last name was Goldstein, so they couldn't hide that very well. And so uh, they moved to some other, joined some other friends in Detroit. <clears throat> Uh, the one twin brother was killed on the Eastern Front, as I'd mentioned. The other twin uh, went to Israel. There are conflicting stories about why he didn't come to the U.S., but even if he had wanted to, he couldn't, he wouldn't have been allowed in because he had tuberculosis and they didn't allow people uh, who had that into this country. So he went to Israel. Kitty never saw him again. This was my parents' cruise ship. Uh, a tr U.S. trooper, uh, and my parents went initially to Little Falls, but the uncle who sponsored them, uh, his family had measles, so the quarantine officer wouldn't let them stay in Little Falls, and they moved to New York to another relative. The only English my mother knew when she came, she said, was goddamn dippies, or displaced persons, is what they, what they were called by the, uh, by the uh, U.S. soldiers. My parents moved uh, to D.C. and then to Denver. Uh, this was this picture was in the Denver Post, uh, a spread on the Nazi survivors coming to the U.S. and making a new life. And here I am, and my brother, and my parents. Um, they then went. Um, back to DC and my father died just when things were going well for them for the first time in their life. Alex waited until everyone else was safely out. <clears throat> uh, and I, I think Alex is the poster child, <coughs> excuse me, poster child of the value of immigrants reinventing themselves too. As I mentioned, he uh, was not allowed to study math he then became a lawyer but couldn't practice. In Germany, he became a watch repairman, then came to the US and became an orthotist, like my father. And then finally, in the late 1950s, went back to school and was able to become a mathematician and a computer scientist. He subsequently became a, a <coughs> highly esteemed uh, at the um, Jet Propulsion Lab uh, in LA. Now, in 1978, my mother learned that she had a nephew who was still alive that she hadn't known about. And that's a whole other strange story. But <clears throat> we wanted, she wanted to go to Hungary to meet him. And otherwise, she would never have set foot in Hungary uh, because she hated the place so much. But when we went back to, to meet this nephew, she also said she really wanted to meet this woman, <clears throat> uh, Betty Lushansi. And I didn't know why, I didn't know my mother's history at that point. She was <clears throat> very uh, non-communicative about things that had happened. But Betty, I knew, had uh, 12 siblings. She was a good Catholic girl and came from a large family. And so I went to Debrecen and I literally went knocking door to door around the old neighborhood <clears throat> and said, does anybody know this Lushensi family? And damned if we weren't lucky and somebody did. And this is Kitty with, uh, with, um, with Betty Lushensi, but 
I was able to reunite them, reunite my mother with her, and it was just incredible joy when they when they saw each other again. And I really wish I'd known the stories at that time because, <clears throat> to me, Betty was you know another sorry another dumpy middle aged woman kind of like I am, and um, it didn't look like she had anything distinguishing about her. But later I learned that that Betty had gone back to Sharon to offer Kitty her own identification card and birth certificate because Kitty was blonde haired and blue eyed. She later hid the photos that we have under the thatched roof of her house. And she brought my father, she, she and her father brought my mother food when they were star starving in the ghetto. <clears throat> so I, uh, she and she immediately took my aunt Claudia and when Claudia found her way back to uh, back to Debrecen. I wish I'd known those stories. Uh, I had no idea that um, normal people could could be hiding their heroic acts like that. And uh, it was quite a lesson for me. This was my wedding in 1984. And this is Betty and her husband, Jack, the Air Force uh, captain, Kitty, my uncle Alex, my mother, uh, Clara and her husband, and Miklos and his wife, Ella, who was the student in the first picture. And unfortunately, my father is the only one missing from that picture. Sorry. Uh, I want to switch for a minute uh, for a brief interlude. As I mentioned in 1938, the Evian Conference, uh, re all these countries got together and refused to accept Jews. In 1939, the, the ship, the SS St. Louis, was denied entry to Cuba and then to the US and then to Canada. Nobody wanted the Jews. Passengers were returned to Europe and many were put in concentration camps and killed. Do you see parallels to what's going on today? Kitty certainly has shared with me many of the parallels that uh, she's seen as, as have uh, some of my other relatives. So I know that some of you will not have the same um, perspective that, that I do and that they did, but I, want to sh I need to share their perspective with you. So last fall, the US limited refugees to 18,000 and emphasized ex accepting only Christian refugees, despite this being the worst refugee and humanitarian crisis since World War II. Our country gave Turkey free reign to attack the Kurds, an ethnic group in Syria. And we did not uh, accept Kurdish, uh, uh, Kurdish asylum seekers. In 1930s in Germany, Jews, Romas, and Blacks were deprived of citizenship. The Nazis used racism to rise into power against Jews and non-Aryans. And their motto was literally, make Germany great again. What do you see happening here? There was the big lie and the press were called the Lugan press, which is literally the lying press. Now we have gaslighting and fake news. Same, same thing, different, different uh, decade. I won't go through all of this so we have more time for, for questions. There's increasing hate crimes and white nationalist murders for years. There were a few early on, 212, uh, the Sikh, temp S Sikh temple, uh, 2015, the Emanuel AME and a mosque, but increasingly, uh, there have been anti-Muslim and anti-Jewish uh, white nationalist murders since 2017. And here are just a few of them. Here, the immigrants and refugees were described as invaders or an invasion. And then last fall, we had uh, the attempted bombing in Pueblo, Colorado. We had Swastikas painted at a number of campuses, including my daughter's uh, old school Smith and UMass Amherst. This is the Jewish cemetery near where Kitty lives, where headstones were toppled there. And then there were the New York and New Jersey uh, murders. One of the things that shocked me, but didn't really surprise me, is that uh, under the, the 
current political climate is that Iranian American citizens were detained last January after we assassinated uh, uh, General Soleimani and they were uh, held for hours um, and uh, ICE and CBP denied that this happened even though it was uh, well known to be to be true. We have these hor horrifying news headlines uh, when Jewish means being being Jewish means being afraid, feel, fearing Muslim terrorists, even though white white supremacists white supremacists commit most of the acts of terror here. Tamir Rice and other kids being killed by by police, and then from uh, recently scenes of uh, protests. This is an article that I wrote uh, a few weeks ago on pepper spray, health effects of pepper spray and tear gas. And the kids, the kids in, in uh, detention camps. And when I see pictures like this, what I see isn't just the kids. I see my mother laying on the floor at Auschwitz uh, behind barbed wire with her one piece of bread a day and now we're doing the same thing to a whole generation uh, of kids simply because they're seeking their families are seeking asylum and by the way a lot of people don't know i hear from many uh they should come legally seeking asylum is legal and you have to be on the u.s property in order to claim asylum so by not allowing people into the u.s uh latin american uh, into the U.S. anymore, we are preventing them from even being able to, to claim uh, seeking asylum. Kitty talks a lot now. Uh, as I mentioned, she hid that she was Jewish until 2008, and since that time, she's become an avid Holocaust educator. She lives to talk to students, and some of her lessons are uh, to the students are to stop the othering and divisiveness she emphasizes that we, we all want the same things in life. She emphasizes the kindness that people showed them and that kindness is its own form of resistance. Any of those people who helped her, Tote Bachi, uh, the housekeeper who bribed others to get her out of jail, any of those people, somebody who shared food in the camp, those who, who helped hold my mother up uh, in the camp, each of those things risked death. And yet there were people who were brave enough to, to do that. So don't, don't be a bystander, stand up to injustice and protect others, be a witness. Read news, news from a variety of sources uh, and try to work to make positive change and vote. It's the one thing we, we have. Here's Kitty speaking uh, last year at the Omaha Public Library. Julia, I feel, I feel um, at a loss, she had over 400 people there, uh, the, uh, the library said. Uh, so I'm really impressed that Kitty uh, in her 80s was able to reinvent herself and become a Holocaust educator. Um, and uh, that's part of what's inspired me to, to want to speak more to, to groups uh, like you. Um, Elie Wiesel said the opposite of, of love uh, is indifference. Uh, S Senator Kennedy said, similarly, each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. So we need to keep that up and try to uh, remain active and emphasize uh, kindness. Uh, these are some of the people who, through their acts of kindness, helped save, save my family's life. Kindness was critical to their survival. There, here are some other people uh, listed there. And that's pretty much it. So I wanted to leave time so we had questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, your family has an extraordinary story and I really respect the amount of time and effort that you've put into collecting all those details. It really um, paints an important picture and I also appreciate the um, different points that you brought up very timely. And uh, there are several comments and questions that are coming into the chat box. So I'm gonna scroll back up to the top 
And the first one um, says, this is from Andrew and Sarah, and it says, we are doing similar family research and are wondering how she has images of her family pre-war. Were the images saved by her family or did she find them in an archive? Okay, uh, that Betty Lushensi saved them under her thatched roof. And that's the only reason we have those pictures. From my father's side of the family, uh, he had a few people like his, his uh, great uncle who had already immigrated and they would send pictures uh, to the family that came here. But from my mother's side of the family, it was all saved by, by, um, by that woman who, who was their friend and wanted to help them. And she, she saved a few pieces of jewelry too. And even though they were dirt poor, they never dreamt of keeping any of it. Um, Andrew and Sarah also ask, how did you translate the, these many documents, any specific services that you would recommend for translating documents? No, uh, I wish. You can, um, there are things like Jewish Gen, Jewish genealogy has, you can submit some documents and people will help you translate them. Uh, I used Google mostly and there are some documents that I couldn't understand, I uh, sent to this relative in Hungary and asked him to help with, and to actually a Twitter friend uh, who, who is Hungarian, who has been very generous in translating things for me. Yes, we're, we're lucky, definitely, that there are some easy and kind of free services, like you had mentioned on Google, where you can look up little translators, type in sentences, and it will um, not always 100% accurate, <laughs> but it will give you the translation. So that's definitely, I, I appreciate you pointing people in that direction. Um, another question that came in says, any other significant places to find documents aggregated besides the United States Memorial Holocaust Museum? Uh, Yad Vashem. Uh, I didn't need to use them that much, but Yad Vashem. Bad Arelson, with the International Tracing Service. Um, Though, again, they did not come up with anything for me, but they are supposed to be uh, a major resource uh, for people. One of the things I, I did, again, uh, is I used Jewish Gen, and they have discussion groups. You know, they have a Hungarian listserv, and you can type in questions. I, people directed me, for example, uh, when I was looking for when my grandfather was was killed, I was trying to find the dates that trains went from the ghetto in in Romania, Najvarod or, or Oradia now, uh, Romania to Auschwitz, and people on on that site told me that uh, there were records the the Germans kept records when the trains crossed the border from Hungary and directed me to those records. Now, as, as, as it turned out, they didn't have that particular date. Uh, but, but, you know, you can, you can find by asking on these, these discussion groups uh, uh, for sources like that. Okay, thank you. Um, Joanne asks, as a physician, do you see a connection between resilience and health? <laughs> uh, Yes, of course, uh, but how, how my family, uh, as I say, my, my father died when he was 50. The other ones were all in their 90s, despite what they went through in the Holocaust. And I have no idea how they survived that long other than they were tough and determined and had made good lives for themselves. Uh, and um, my mother was not the optimist, but, Kitty, for example, you know, focuses on hope and, and, and uh, uh, teaching others. Uh, my mother was more motivated by, by the comment one of, one of uh, her friends said, you know, Mrs. Stone, every day you live, another Nazi dies. And mm -hmm. that just fueled her <laughs> uh, to prove that, that she was tougher and to, you know, to go on and have have children and grandchildren but yes whatever you can do to to whatever brings you hope and resilience and the kindness sustain them yes that that was huge 
Um, Antonia has made a comment. She says, this is a very important perspective. Thank you, Ms. Stone, for connecting the dots and pointing out the parallels. Um, David has commented, thank you, Dr. Stone, for your presentation this evening. Mary has asked, what do you think motivated Kitty to become an educator after such a long period of silence about her identity? So uh, the Omaha had uh, the 50th anniversary of uh, World War II and the liberation. And uh, somebody got in touch with her. And when she met some of the liberators, she became involved in, in the education then and decided that, you know, it was, it was time. Um, that there weren't more, um, that there weren't enough survivors left. Um, and uh, she, she just has, uh, the response of the students, they've all been thrilled and have uh, inspired her to keep teaching. She says she, she feels like a rock star when, uh, literally, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. So, so um, she loves feeling useful. It gives her a sense of purpose in her life. Of course, yes. Um, Roberta has asked a question. She says, how are holidays celebrated today? I'm not sure specifically what she means by that, Roberta, if you wanna type in an elaboration, but um, maybe she's referring to holidays within your family. Well, <laughs> uh, very, very poorly, uh, because, um, you know, as I say, uh, Betty's kids were raised Catholic, Kitty's were raised Lutheran. Um, the rest of us had some Jewish upbringing and observed some of the holidays. But uh, as I learned, as I learned, as I did the research, my family didn't really believe very much, most of them. Uh, I think Andy did. Um, but, um, but the sisters, nah, they lost, they lost all of their faith and they liked the rituals. They wanted their, their kids to have some sense of, uh, heritage but, and tradition, but there was no, no sense of belief. Mm, yes. She, she actually elaborated a little bit and she said, yes, within the family, uh, is it a mix of American and homeland cultures? Um, but it does sound like it's a mix of not just American and homeland, but different religions as well. Very much so. And, and my kids grew up observing uh, Christmas and Christian religions as well as Jewish. Okay, I think we have time for one last question here. It says, uh, isn't there some evidence that Holocaust survivors have increased longevity? Have you seen any research about that? I have not seen that. I have not seen that. I, I would welcome references about that, or I'll go back to Dr. Google. Uh, but no, I haven't seen that. Mm. Um, but my, my family was very fortunate. But again, I, and, and part of what made me write the book, I didn't know until after my mother died and I went to a Holocaust conference for the first time in my life. I didn't know that only 10% of the Hungarian Jews survived. Mm. And almost nobody outside of, uh, of Budapest. And so that's when I said, whoa, our family is really different. I wonder how that happened and began researching it. Um, and our last comment to come in is, my dear cousin Judy, thank you for what you are doing. Love you, Sharon. Um, well, thank you, Sharon. I see you at the bottom <laughs> of the screen. And it's really heartwarming to, to see a couple of people I know. And as we close, Judy, can you tell us, um, is your book available now and where can people get it if they're interested? Well, through, through your library, through your local bookstore. Okay. Uh, I would encourage that or through the Evil Empire, Amazon has it. It's available mm -hmm. in paperback and uh, Kindle. And again, uh, at this point, all, any, any profits from it, all of the profits uh, from it are going to go for Holocaust education. Thank you so much, Judy. This has been a very, very insightful and interesting conversation. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. I do encourage you if you, um, if you would like to share this program, I'm going to be posting a recording of it on Camden Public Library Program's YouTube page. Um, and if you are interested in joining us for any other programs, please visit 
librarycamden.org and request a Zoom link from me and I'm happy to send it along. So I wish everyone a wonderful rest of your evening and thank you again, Judy. Thank you, Julia. Bye-bye.